Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray as we open the Scriptures that you would open our eyes to see Him for who He really is, to understand who we are in relationship to Him. And we ask it in His name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be looking at that Gospel text. And if you don't have your Bibles, please grab a pew Bible. There should be one under your seat or in the seat in front of you or next to you. Um, John chapter 18, and you'll find that on page 904 of your pew Bibles. Um, <clears throat> we're coming to the end of the Christian year. Uh, we follow at this church the lectionary, the Revised Common Lectionary. And I've been asked, why do we do that? Um, it's a program of scripture readings that um, the Protestant churches mostly the Episcopalians have their own lectionary, the High Lutherans have their own lectionary, the Catholic Church has its own lectionary, but the rest of us follow the Revised Common Lectionary. And I like to follow it for your protection, because um, if I don't have that, then I'll get up on my hobby horse and give you my favorite sermon every week. And you'll get tired of hearing the same thing week after week. So as the texts change, and through the course of three years, you work your way through the Bible. There's a psalm, there's an Old Testament reading, there's the gospel, there's a New Testament reading. And as we read these in church over the course of three years, you're working your way through the Bible, and you get the sweep of the whole Bible. So that's a positive thing. The Christian year ends on what today is known as Christ the King, Christ the King Sunday. It's a reminder to us uh, who is the King, and the question before us is what is our relationship to the King? Um, are we in good stead with the King? That we are accountable to our Creator. Next week begins Advent, and so next week is New Year's. It's not on January 1st. Um, it's the promise of the coming of the Messiah. And again, the lectionary is I like because it makes me and it makes us together rehearse the gospel every year. Advent begins with the promise of the coming of the Messiah. Christmas is the coming, the incarnation, the coming of that Messiah, God come to earth. Epiphany is that his ministry wasn't just for the Jews, but it's for the whole world. Lent, that we enter into Christ's sacrifice for us by fasting and prayer in recognition of his coming sacrifice for us at Good Friday. And then Easter, his resurrection. And Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And all of these things are a reminder, a repetition of the story of the good news of the gospel. So again, it's to your benefit and for your protection that we do that uh, here at this church. So this morning is Christ the King Sunday. And again, the question that we have to ask is, what is our relationship to this Christ, our King? I've told you in the past about um, Christian Smith. He is a sociologist at the University of Notre Dame. He says that in most Protestant churches, those churches that don't use the lectionary, what most people get isn't the gospel. What they get is moralistic, therapeutic deism. Be a nice person. Be good. That's what the faith is. Just be nice. Um, that's not the Christian faith. But a lot of people think that that's what the Christian faith is. Moralistic, therapeutic. Um, you come to church and you'll hear sermons on six ways to have championship children and five ways to have a Christ-like marriage. And you get these hobby horse sermons that the pastor likes to give year after year after year. Um, I attended a church uh, when I was in my 20s and a friend of mine left the church and I'm like, what's going on? Did something bad happen? He said, no. But by the fifth time I heard that series of sermons, I could have given it. Um, I'm tired of hearing the same thing over and over. I want to hear the whole counsel of God. I want to hear all of what the scriptures teach, not just his favorite series of sermons. And so um, that's what we're trying to do here this morning. Three guys went out on a Friday night, and uh, they, sadly they got into a car accident and they were killed. And off to heaven they went, and there was an orientation class in heaven. And uh, at the orientation class, they were asked to write down the answer to the question, um, so what would you like to hear your family and friends say as they gather around your co coffin on, um, at your funeral? And the first guy said, well, I would hope that they would say he was a good family man and he was a really good physician and he saved a lot of lives through his skill and understanding as a physician. And the second guy, a school teacher, said, oh, that he was a loving husband and that he really had an impact on the lives of a number of uh, students that were in his charge and in his care. And they came to the third guy and he wrote down on his piece of paper, look, he's moving. 
<laughs> we laugh because somewhere in our heart of hearts, we think that perhaps, sadly, this is all there is. That this life is all that there is. That there is no heaven. That there is no afterlife. That, there, that, that this, this is it. Um, and this isn't it, according to what the scriptures teach. Um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says this, For inasmuch as it is appointed for each one to die, each man to die once, and after this comes judgment. You don't go around and around and around until you get it right. And you don't get a second chance after death. No, this is, this is the dress rehearsal. This is it. This is all you get. And after this comes judgment. We stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this is Christ our King Sunday. And so on this Sunday, place yourself before your King and decide whether or not you're a member of his kingdom. That's what we have going on in this dialogue between Pilate and Jesus. Um, they are at Pilate's uh, city home. Um, Pilate likes to live at the beach. Uh, most of us would, if we could, choose to do that. Um, he's got a villa in Caesarea. Uh, he hates Jerusalem. He doesn't like the Jews. And he only comes to Jerusalem when he has to the big feasts of the year, Pentecost and uh, the Feast of Booths and all these various feasts. He's got to come for those, but otherwise he stays down at the beach. And I want to give you a little backstory to this. So, um, Jesus has made a nuisance of himself with the Jewish leaders. Um, if you read the Gospels carefully, you'll see that he has cleansed the temple. Um, he's disrupted business, as usual, in the temple. Um, he's overturned the tables. He's chased them out of the temple. Um, the leaders of the Jews aren't very happy about this. Now, in the Gospels, and particularly in John's Gospel, when it says the Jews... It doesn't mean every Jewish person who lives in Jerusalem. It means the leadership of the Jewish people. It means the Sanhedrin. It means the high priests. That's who it's talking about when it says the Jews. It's not every, his disciples were Jewish. It's not every Jew. It's the leadership of the Jewish people, the religious leadership of the Jewish people. And they've delivered Jesus over to Pilate. They've already held their mock trial. And they presented him to Annas. Annas was the COO, the chief operating officer. Um, Jews were only supposed to have one high priest, but they had two. Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the current high priest. But he was recognized as the high priest. And he was in charge of the business of the money changing and the sacrifices and the animals and all that stuff that was getting funneled through the temple. And they were making money hand over fist. Well, Jesus messed that all up and they didn't like that. And then they presented him to Caiaphas, the other high priest. Um, and he said it would be better for Christ to die and get him out of here than to stir up the crowds and create a problem. And then the, Jew the Romans will come down on us like a hammer. So let's kill him and get, get him out of here. And so they've made up their mind that Jesus is a problem. And his sin in the eyes of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, is blasphemy. That he makes himself out to be God. Um, and they won't have that. But the problem is that the Sanhedrin, the highest court in Israel, doesn't have the right of capital punishment. They have to get the permission of the Roman governor in order to, uh, to execute uh, a prisoner, with one exception. If somebody comes into the temple and desecrates the temple, messes up the temple in some way, that person can be executed by the temple police. But it's got to be a religious desecration. Jesus didn't do a religious desecration. He drove the animals and the money changers out of the temple, but he didn't undermine the worship of what was taking place in the temple. So we've got this background. The Sanhedrin has wants the death penalty for Jesus. And now they bring him to Pilate. And so who is Pilate? We know from Jewish uh, writers like Josephus and Roman writers like Philo that Pilate was just horrible. The Jews haven't had a king in Israel uh, since Herod the Great. And Herod was so corrupt and so awful that Rome said never again will the Jews have their own king. Now the Romans allowed certain nations to have a vassal king who ruled in their name, 
with the power of Rome behind them, like Herod had when Herod was living. Um, but Herod was so corrupt, Rome said, never again. And so there were a succession of Roman governors. And Pilate was the fifth in succession after Herod the Great. Um, he ruled from 26 to 36 uh, AD. And uh, the Roman writers and the Jewish writers are all in agreement, um, very critical of him, that he was a brutal, bloodthirsty ruler. And um, there was a reason for that. Pilate was a member of the lower aristocracy. And so he hitched his wagon to a rising star. The wagon's name was Mark Antony. Antony and Cleopatra, you may remember that story. And so Antony was his patron. And Pilate's moral calculus wasn't about, is this right? Is this wrong? His moral calculus was, how do I please Mark Antony, and how do I please my patrons in Rome, and how do I get myself a better position, a better job in the bureaucracy of the Roman government, rather than being in this backwater province stuck here in Israel, which is the end of a lot of people's careers. I want to get back to Rome and get into a position of power. So everything that he did was um, done through the lens of that goal of getting back to Rome and pleasing his Roman masters. And now he's got a problem. It's the weekend of the Passover. Jesus has been presented by the Jews, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, the, the, high, the high priests of Israel, and they want to have him put to death. And Pilate, he doesn't care about the internecine theological fights of Jews, the different groups. The Sadducees believe this, and the Pharisees believe that, and the Essenes moved out of town, and they live out in the desert. And He doesn't care about any of that stuff. And now they brought him Jesus, and they're asking him to be the arbiter of that. Well, Pilate won't make a decision based on their theology. He doesn't care about their theology. So they've trumped up a political case. They've said that Jesus is claiming to be the king of the Jews. Well, there hasn't been a, Jew, a king since Herod. And there won't be any more kings in Israel. And so um, Pilate now has this problem. There's a political question here. Is he setting himself up against Caesar? Is he setting himself up against the Roman government and calling himself a king? Now, he's never met Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus from the man in the moon. And so the Jews won't enter into his palace, Herod's palace. It's near the temple. Um, he's unclean. He's a Gentile dog. So they stand out before his porch, and they come and they make their case to him. And Jesus has been delivered to them. So Jesus is down in the cellars in the jail. And so Pilate sends for Jesus. And this is where our story begins in verse 31. John 18, verse 31. Pilate said to them, the Jews, the Jewish leaders, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Well, they've done that. We want to kill him. And the Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. If you look in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 8, verse 31, uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 31, Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, three times he tells them, the Son of Man is going to be given over to the chief priest, to the leaders of the Jewish nation, and he will be crucified, and on the third day he will rise again. Disciples heard it repeatedly. They did not understand it at all. John is reminding us that Jesus made this prediction, made this promise, and that this is the fulfillment. In the providence of God, as awful as this is, this was God's plan from the beginning, that Jesus was to come and to die for the sins of the world. Jewish people didn't get that. They wanted a mighty military ruler. Uh, they wanted somebody to overthrow Rome and to restore them to prosperity and restore them to glory and power and honor. It was a theology of glory. It wasn't the theology of the cross. And they did not understand who Jesus was or why he came. Verse 33, so Pilate entered the praetorium. He entered his headquarters. Headquarters for Pilate when he was in Jerusalem was Herod's old palace. So he goes into Herod's palace and they bring Jesus up from the cellars, from the jail below. Now Jesus has already spent the night in Gethsemane. He has prayed all night long. He's haggard. He's tired. He sweat bloody drops, and so his robe is stained with that blood. He was beaten by the temple police. His face, his features are swollen and disfigured, and he's in a peasant robe. And he's brought before Pilate, 
And he stands erect. He looks him straight in the eye. There's no dissembling. He's completely self-possessed. Pilate has experience with the zealots. Pilate has experience with false Christs. And the person who has been brought before him is completely unlike these other false Christs and the zealots who want to overthrow Rome. They usually are either sullen because they've been caught and they're going to be killed and crucified, or they're belligerent and they're breathing threats and making threats against Pilate and against the Roman Empire. And here is Jesus in his right mind, completely self-possessed, and he's looking straight at Pilate. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus, and he said to him, now he's having a private meeting with Jesus. This isn't done on the porch in front of the Jewish leaders. He wants to get to the bottom of this. And especially now that he's seen the guy, look, this is not an, a th any kind of threat to Rome. This guy's a peasant. He's no threat to Rome. So he brings him in, and he begins to have this, this interrogation. Are you the king of the Jews? Um, in all four Gospels, as this parallel passage is, is looked at, that you is emphatic. You? You're a peasant. You? You're, you're beat up already. You? You're the king of the Jews? So on one hand, it's this incredulous exclamation of, it's not possible that you, you, could, you couldn't possibly be the king of anybody. And then the second part is political. I mean, he wants to know the answer. Now, he's got to get Jesus to confess. The Jewish authorities have brought him no evidence that Jesus has done anything that is seditious, anything that is rebellious, anything that's fomenting insurrection or riot in Jerusalem. Those are the things that Pilate cares about. And they have brought him no evidence that he's done any of those things. So he needs Jesus to say, yes, I'm the king of the Jews. If Jesus does that, his moral calculus is easy. You set yourself up as the pretender to the throne. We kill you. You're done and over with, and it's all easy and taken care of. Not so fast with Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And I love this. Jesus answered, and I'm going to break this up. Do you say this of your own accord? Now, Jesus has never met Pilate before. Jesus doesn't know Pilate. Pilate doesn't know Jesus. Jesus is seeking the heart of Pilate. Because Jesus knows that there are people who, on the basis of what they've heard about him, have believed in him. There was the Roman centurion whose servant was suffering. And Jesus said of him, I haven't seen faith like yours in all of Israel. Um, there was... Um, um, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. And he was a secret disciple, a secret follower of Jesus. He wouldn't do it in the daylight where other people could see him coming to see Jesus. So he snuck around at night to go and meet with Jesus. It was Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea who took Pilate's, or took Jesus' body and placed it in Joseph's tomb. Um, he was a secret disciple. So Pilate, Jesus doesn't know whether Pilate might actually believe in him or not. Um, so um, he says, do you, do you ask this question of your own accord? But there's a second part to why he asks this. Jesus understands Roman law. We used to understand that law because our law is based on British common law, which was based on the Roman law, that you cannot be convicted of a crime on the basis of hearsay. Now we've just had our own political circus, um, Judge Kavanaugh. They wanted him convicted and, and dismembered on the basis of hearsay, on the basis of somebody said something about him that was bad. Um, Pilate can't execute Jesus on the basis of hearsay. Jesus knows that Pilate can't execute him on the basis of hearsay. There has to be either evidence or Jesus has to confess to the crime himself. Jesus isn't going to confess, and there is absolutely no evidence. But there's a problem for Pilate. Again, his moral calculus isn't, is this right or wrong? Is this just or unjust? His moral calculus is, what if I let him go and there's a riot? Then I'll get in trouble with Rome. Or what if I kill him and there's a riot? I'll get in trouble with Rome. So Pilate's stuck between a rock and a hard place. He doesn't know what he's going to do with this Jesus. Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Hearsay evidence. And Pilate now, now I, I like this too. So Pilate went from the interrogator. He went from the judge to the one being interrogated. Pilate's used to people telling him what he needs to hear to let them off. Oh, no, no, I'm not a king. I'm just a peasant. I'm a carpenter. Thanks. See ya. That's, that's what he's expecting to hear, but that's not what he gets. 
Jesus looks him right in the eye and Jesus begins to interrogate Pilate. Jesus is now asking the questions and Pilate doesn't like it. And Pilate gets defensive. Whoa, whoa, am I a Jew? I don't care about your theology. I don't care about your theological fights and differences. That's not why we're here. I need to know whether you claim to be a king or not. So Pilate says, am I a Jew? He's defensive. He's, he's responding to Jesus. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. S seriously, dude, what have you done? What is going on? Why do they hate you so much? Well, they hate him because he disrupted the business in the temple. They hate him because he called them whitewashed sepulchers. They hate him because he said they were hypocrites. They hate him because he lowered their esteem in the eyes of the general population. He lowered their, their esteem and their reputation in the eyes of the regular people. They hate his guts and they want him put down like a rabid dog. But he's not rabid. He's in his right mind. He's interrogating Pilate. He's, he's, he knows what's going on. And Pilate doesn't know what to do with him. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Um, if you have your own Bible, not our pew Bibles, take your pencil, your pen, and strike out the word of and write the word from. They're using the wrong preposition there. If it's, my kingdom is not of this world, and that means that Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual neverland that exists in the by and by, in the future someplace, but not in the here and now. And that most assuredly is not what Jesus' kingdom is about or what it means. Jesus' kingdom came and was inaugurated by Jesus. The good news of the gospel in Mark chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 4 is he came preaching, repent, believe the good news, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He inaugurated the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is already at work in the world, in the world. Not up in heaven, but in the world. In fact, Jesus claimed in Matthew chapter 28 that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he's not disclaiming that his kingdom is of or from this world. Um, he's not disclaiming that at all. In fact, he taught his disciples, and we just prayed it, may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. It's already started to do that, but it hasn't reached its fullness yet. So Jesus isn't denying that his kingdom is, is, deals with this world, this cosmos, this created order. What he's saying when he says, my kingdom is not from this world, um, especially in John's gospel, with one notable exception, and we all know the notable exception, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, but in John's gospel and in John's epistles, John, when he talks about the world, the world is that element which is in active rebellion against God. An example of that would be 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. John writes this, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, these things are not from the Father, they're from the world. So Jesus is saying, uh, he's not essentialist. He's not, it's not about his senses, the things that he can touch and that he can feel and that he can smell. That the kingdom isn't like that. The kingdom is real. The kingdom is in this world, but the kingdom isn't like Pilate's kingdom. Pilate got his throne by Roman might, by Roman power, by coercion of the people. Jesus says, my kingdom is not from the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. That's not what my kingdom is like. His kingdom is real, but it's not like the kingdoms of the world, which rise to power by bloodshed and by war and by the exercise of power. And Jesus doesn't work that way. We'll get to that further in just a moment. So Jesus says, um, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my servants would have been fighting. See, if you and I were the same and I was a king and you were a king, then my soldiers, my people would go to war to protect me and to keep me from being delivered into your hands. But Jesus said, no, no, no. I came to bear witness. I am a king and I came to bear witness of the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is a person. He came to bear witness of himself, that he is the king. But he's not a king by earthly standards. And so Pilate, he's looking at him and he just doesn't get it. You're a metaphysical king. 
Dang it. If you were a political king, I could put you to death. What the heck is a metaphysical king? You came to bear witness to the truth. What do I do with that? Do I kill you or don't I kill you? My wife Claudia had a dream. And she said, have nothing to do with this man. He's innocent. Don't get involved in this trial, this, this mockery. Just go back to, uh, to, to Capernaum. Get out of there. And, and don't mess with him. Um, Caesarea, not Capernaum. And, and Pilate, again, he's stuck. He's in this quandary. And he doesn't know what to do. He says that they would be fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said, so you are a king? Just say yes. And this could all be over with. And I can go home. Just say yes. Jesus doesn't say yes. He says, you say that I'm a king. Oh, don't you love Jesus? You say that I'm a king. Now, yes, he is a king. Um, yes, he owns it right there. But he doesn't say it in a way that Pilate can convict him of anything. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Oh! And so Pilate is stuck. So now what do we have? We have the Roman governor who has all of the authority of the Roman emperor and his troops behind him. So we have a worldly king and then we have Jesus, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And the king of kings is interrogating this Roman king who has all the authority and the power. And what we have is a contrast between two kings and two kingdoms. Pilate is ambitious. Pilate would do anything for honor and power and prestige and glory. And our king? Our king left all that behind. Philippians chapter 2. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to cling to, to hang on to. He emptied himself. The Greek word is kenosis. To pour himself out. He emptied himself of his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, of all of his uh, powers and attributes as God. He poured all of that out in order that he might come here and be a servant. Pilate had, Pilate had servants. He expected to be waited on hand and foot. He was the governor. He was the most important and powerful person, maybe a backwater province, but here I'm a big fish in a small pond, and everybody does what I want them to do. And Jesus, I came that you, not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Pilate is arrayed in his royal robes. He's wearing purple, a sign of his royalty and his power and his prestige. And Jesus, he's there in a peasant's robe that's stained with blood and it's sweaty and it's stinky because he's been on the road. It's the difference between those who place all of the importance on the outward appearance of things rather than the inward reality of things. Pilate was a sensualist. He liked his villa on the Mediterranean. He liked nice furniture and nice things. He liked nice food and good food. And Jesus, Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. He didn't have a place to call his own home. What we have here is the comparison and the contrast between the kingdoms of this world and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And on this Christ our King Sunday, the question before us as we began is the same at the end. Is Christ your king, and do you have a place in his kingdom? Amen.